And um, I thought I'd start, given that the first couple of days don't really cover hypnosis um, because it's more therapy bit, I thought I'd start by guiding you through a hypnotic experience just because we've got to squeeze hypnosis in there somewhere. <laughs> so um, if you want to get yourself comfortable, I don't know why I'm getting myself comfortable as well. It's good to be comfortable. I know, it is. Even if you're in your chair. Yeah. yeah. Um, so through this first part of the course, we don't cover the Ericksonian stuff, although we sort of do. So we don't cover it as Ericksonian hypnosis. So there's stuff like about language that we cover, but it's in context with therapy, uh, but the same applies when you're doing it um, for the hypnosis part. So we talk about presuppositions, for example, um, implying something uh, a certain direction. Um, but we talk about it in relation to therapy for this first part. So the hypnosis part that you learn this time around is more classical, normal hypnosis, but slight Ericksonian slant. So I don't tell you to say you will do this and you will do that, but I, it's more structured. And likewise with the hypnotic inductions, we cover self-hypnosis in this part. So again, that self-hypnosis generally, apart from what I was just telling you in the other room, is fairly structured hypnotic inductions that you can teach to somebody that they can then follow in their own mind, whether it's progressive relaxation or um, eyes opening and eyes closing or whatever it happens to be. They're fairly structured inductions that as a therapist, it's really easy if someone says, look, just give me a technique I can do at home. It's easy to teach a client a technique they can do at home. It's easy to guide them through it. And then uh, in the session where you can watch them sort of keep going in and out of a trance and you can then obviously have them do that themselves in the session, followed by going home, knowing that they've set it up for themselves. There are other ways, as we'll cover when we get to self-hypnosis, that you can do as well. Um, so for now, whilst you're comfortable, just allow your eyes to close a moment. And just take a moment. Some of you have come from a long way away over the last few days, others from a little nearer. But just allow yourself to almost begin to centre yourself here. Being aware of traffic, birds. Perhaps if you're breathing. And any other sounds you can hear. And just take a few moments to begin to think about what it is you'd like to get from this week. It could be just a mental image or it could be some words or ideas, just something you'd like to get from this week. almost like something that will allow you to notice the things towards that direction as they happen. And as the day goes on and the week goes on, there'll be times your attention will focus in on something that catches your attention. There may even be times your attention is drawn to tension and that tension can disappear as the attention is drawn to the tension. And times perhaps confusion can set in. The interesting thing is after any period of confusion, you can discover clarity. You can discover something new and learn. And so it's really interesting to take this time now 
to begin to allow your unconscious to be in the right place here so that you can receive what you learn consciously and unconsciously. And you'll all be learning about observation, about utilization, about what to do before and after the part people may well say is hypnosis and how to just be hypnotic even though most of the beginning of this will be focused on the therapy side and giving you a structure around therapy You'll learn how to be hypnotic. And how to experience trance on the inside as well as the outside. So you know, it's important for therapists to go into trance as well. To do most effective therapy. Because when you go into a trance yourself, you become more observant. You can get a sense of calmness. You can increase your focus. make connections that perhaps consciously you would have missed. And you'll learn to use this information in your own style in your own way, making it your own. And in a moment before you come back to the room, you can have an awareness of different feelings and sensations and thoughts and ideas of trance from the inside so that when you see trance from the outside, you'll have an idea of what the person's experiencing. Then in your own time, you can drift back to the room. See, what I always like is the quiet after. Quite nice when everyone just sits quietly, having gone inside for a moment. So what would people like to get specifically?
from this first half of the training. So even though we're not covering hypnosis as such, I think trance is a fundamental part of what it means to be a living being. I think at least for any um, significantly multicellular being, trance is there. Trance is the more fundamental part of what it means to be alive. It's, it is that sort of unconscious running part of you. So we have a conscious mind, which is obviously more recently evolved. Um, but underneath that, obviously, we were just instinctive. We were like many other animals. We even um, bacteria will normally go towards something that's good and away from something that's bad. So they have some level of awareness that you wouldn't call conscious, but they have some level of awareness of head towards good, head away from bad, and clump together. Um, you, know, you see bacteria that all clump together when there's suddenly a lack of water because they're bacteria and they need to have be slightly moist or whatever. So as the water disappears, they just have this tendency to go to nearer to others and then clump together. And I remember a lecture by Ernest Rossi where he talked about could that have been what led to the first multicellular life, that um, it's a natural thing that single cells clump together to because they need to then share, uh, they have less surface around them, they need to then share um, all that moisture and keep it all together, but then eventually they somehow manage to stick together and stay together and then work together. And then as they work together, they evolve gradually into getting different functions and realizing, oh, if we work together, like some jellyfish have, where they're not, not actually a jellyfish, it's a whole community of organisms and they all have their own different functions. You'll have some organisms that specifically do digestion, some organisms that specifically do the stinging or whatever. And they, you, I can't remember which jellyfish specifically, but there's one that is like that, that every part of it is actually a different animal or a different sort of organism that all benefits each other. And so Rossi's uh, hypothesis or view was, could that have been how multicellular life started? That it just, you know, rather than a single cell on its own, they clumped together because it, the pools were drying up perhaps and they needed to make use of what water there was and then gradually that became actually you know what when we clump together all the time we have a better survival chance and then it was you know what when we clump together all the time but have slightly different roles there's an even better survival chance and then gradually things develop um, but underlying it all was this sort of drive I'm going to say an unconscious drive but they probably didn't have a conscious or an unconscious as such but um, there's this drive that's sort of innate or built in to go towards things that are good or helpful and healing and going to benefit your survival, make you live a bit longer, and move away from the things that may cause you further harm. Um, and you would do that by releasing certain chemical messengers into your blood, uh, or in their case, just out into whatever's outside of the cell that then gets picked up. Um, like people always say, if you stand on a bee, the bee sends out chemical messages sends out pheromones and things that then attract all the other bees so they will come after you because you killed their friend um, so it's probably a similar sort of thing that you know one bacteria dying releases a chemical signature that others then pick up on and they react to that as go away from that signature or go towards that signature depending on what's being released um, so my view is that trance is the most fundamental part of what it means to be alive that innate drive that innate part of the bit that makes us do things even when we don't choose consciously to do them or makes us you know something's flying towards you and you swat it away and you don't even know what you're doing because you're holding conversation and you're not thinking about it um that part i think is just the most fundamental part and ericsson used to say that everyone's always in a trance people are never not in a trance um and he was often challenged because uh, people would say, well, Ericsson sees trance everywhere. And then Ericsson would end up saying, yeah, and they just don't see trance anywhere. <laughs> it's right under their nose and they wouldn't know it if, they, if it hit them in the face. Um, so there's always been this conflicting view, and especially around hypnosis, because the question is, is hypnosis something special? Because if it is something special, then yes, you're going to have to find it in specific situations. Whereas if it's not, if trance is trance, then it's about, there's two aspects. If you read things like the Oxford um, hypnosis book, 
it talks about the two aspects of what you call hypnosis. One is the experience of you are being hypnotized and say you're in hypnosis or whatever you want to call it. The other one is the act of doing it. So you use the same term, I'm doing hypnosis or I'm experiencing hypnosis, but you both they both mean slightly different things. So I would say that you can be doing hypnosis because you're influencing trance states. You're influencing natural everyday trances that people are going in and out of all the time. They may not be in hypnosis. So as I'll cover a bit later, I would say hypnosis as the state that you would call hypnosis is the optimal learning state. The state that therapists call hypnosis is the state of mind you go in when you need to learn something, when you update patterns of behavior. Um, it's the state of mind that if you've just been, say you're studying something and you start gazing off out a window, it doesn't mean you're suddenly bored. It means you're suddenly processing this thing you've just learnt. And so your brain needs to go inside regularly, which is, again, why we follow the ultradian rhythm type model. Your brain needs to go inside regularly because or else it can't go into a trance to latch those bits together. So the state that I would say is hypnosis is the optimal learning state. It's a state of mind where you go inside, you update patterns of behavior, which is why hypnosis, that's what hypnosis is known for being very good at, is updating instinctive patterns. So... Um, breaking habits because you change the pattern of the habit or something you update the that pattern or um with say depression or whatever again you update the pattern associated with how you're interacting with reality so the actual hypnotic part is you're constantly updating patterns but that doesn't mean that you only have to do hypnosis in the direction of hypnosis it can be in the direction of happiness or in the direction that all these are trance states. So happiness is a trance state. When you're happy, you view the world from within a trance. So it's a mind-body state. You have certain chemicals flooding through your body, more predominantly when you're happy to say when you're sad. Um, you have different chemicals when you're sad. Um, you have a specific type of heart rate when you're happy. You have a specific type of body posture, a specific way of being, a specific voice tonality. Um, perhaps a specific voice um, speed that you talk at when you're happy versus, say, depressed or something. All of these just come naturally for that state. You don't have to think about <laughs> those bits. You don't have to be, um, I'm happy. How am I supposed to talk? How am I supposed to? They just are there. They're there because you're happy. And so happiness is the state. Um, so hypnosis as a doing two thing could be towards helping someone to be happy. It could be towards, if you're not particularly morally correct, towards helping someone be depressed. You know, you could do it towards anything, any trance state. Um, when we cover the actual hypnotic techniques, then you would see how you could apply that. You know, you get some people that you say, when I'm in their company, I very quickly become down and depressed. And then other people think, when I'm in their company, I very quickly just end up being bouncing and buzzing and just being incredibly positive and motivated. And, so you get this, people just naturally do these. You know, there's no rocket science in hypnosis. Um, bit of an odd sentence to say, but um, because it's all stuff that we all do, some people already do it very, very well. And that, even if they don't realize it, some people are just very good at doing hypnosis and they would never, they may never have learned about hypnosis. They just naturally can take a stage and have everyone running out the door going, I'm going to do this now. And they, they'll go and do what they need to achieve because they're just in that place. They've been somehow got there and the person's thinking, all I do is I go and stand there and I talk. I don't understand. I don't know what happens with them. And so they don't, may not even realize they're doing it. It's just their way of being is very good at getting someone to that place. So trance, we are always in a trance. The question isn't whether we are or not. The question is what trance are we in and how deep or light are we in that trance? So if you're, ecstatically happy and your whole focus is say on happiness then someone being depressed around you probably won't have much of an impact in fact if your state is more pure than theirs the chances are you may be able to influence their state and bring them out of it because you're so much more happy that because of rapport and stuff they just naturally start falling into sync with you instead of you falling into sync with them um 
But whether it's hypnosis or whether it's any other trance, the question is, how deep are they in that state? And I think depth of trance, hypnotists have always said deeper and deeper and use that kind of term. But actually depth of trance really is how absorbed are you? How pure is that state that you're in there and then? So if you're in a very, very pure hypnotic state, you would call that a very deep trance. And you don't have to have said deeper and deeper. Some people can just do it instantly. Some people close their eyes and they're just there. That's, you know, because they've been given permission to go there, they're going to go there. Other people, you really have to work hard at getting them to unhook from all the rest of reality. And, you know, they'll be thinking, I really want this to work, but I can hear traffic. I can hear birds. I can feel this. I can sense that. I'm aware of the chair. I'm... And they're telling themselves all these things. So they're going, they're still in a trance and they're still going that direction, perhaps. But they're not going anywhere near as quickly or as deeply as you maybe you think they might benefit from. Uh, you don't need a deep trance, obviously, for therapy. Um, but it's because they're distracting themselves. And part of that is the skill of the hypnotist. If you can um, work with it, utilise it and think, OK, be aware of these things. So if you can get feedback, a lot of people do hypnosis, never asking for feedback. They want the person to just sit silently, they'll do the work, and that's it. But actually, if you say to somebody, tell me your experience as it happens, they're better at talking during hypnosis. Whereas if you hypnotize someone and then say 20 minutes later, now start talking to me, they've not practiced that for the whole duration of going into trance. So they now have to think, right, how do I get my vocal cords to work again? How do I get my mouth to work? How do I, you know, get my muscles to work again around my face? Because I've just relaxed them to the point of not moving them. And now you're telling me to move them all again. And so suddenly they have to bring themselves out of the state that you've just taken all that time guiding them into to now talk to you again. And, um, and again, some people are just expert at it. So they will naturally, they won't realize they're expert, but they'll just suddenly be able to say, OK, I'll talk. And, and they can just do it. It comes naturally to them. Other people, in fact, most people, um, can't do that. They, you, if you've guided them into a deep state and you've not asked for feedback or anything and not had them talk as they're going in, when you then eventually ask them to talk, they just don't know what to do <laughs> next because it's such a different state of mind you're asking them to do or access. Um, so I know Bandler, uh, Richard Bandler, would often talk about things like designer trances, that um, his thing with um, design human engineering, moving on from NLP, was the idea of yeah, NLP is good for identifying strategies of success, identifying the best ways of doing something and then getting someone to do it who's got a problem. But why should you do that? Why shouldn't you take someone who's already brilliant at something and say, how can I help you to be better? And so you build on it and almost create a designer trance. A, yes, this state is brilliant for you, but what if you tweak this state and just refined it? Is there anything that's not needed in this state? So you can then tweak the state and enhance it and get something even better than what you already thought was really good. Who can go in the zone, but not all the time. So you can sit and play something or whatever, but it's still partly thinking what shopping am I going to do later or you know what do I have to do this evening or they're you know, still thinking other things but every now and then they say oh I just get these moments where every now and then I'm just me and the music and we're one and it's just like it all flows and well how about helping someone to do that all the time and then how to enhance that and keep it at that level so it's um, when you realize that trance is just a natural thing any trance that wouldn't be a hypnotic trance but that'd be a really helpful trance to guide someone into it for that type of situation uh, likewise someone who perhaps deals with disasters uh, may say sometimes i go into a disaster and i'm just so focused i see what i need to see and i do what i need to do other times i go in and i just get anxious or i think i don't know i just can't judge the situation i've gone into it maybe in the wrong like a firefighter or something I'd gone into it and i just couldn't quite judge it there's something wrong and i couldn't figure it out and that frustrated me and i lost that focus and then i messed this up and you hear firefighters occasionally sort of saying this that they've sometimes they run in they just know get everyone out now it just something clicks they know they're in that zone they know something's wrong they don't necessarily know consciously what but they know something's wrong everyone gets out and the building collapses and how did you know that and it could be an air temperature change or um a pressure change even that their ears picked up the fact that the pressure changed and there's maybe a slight popping in the ears or something uh, like going up in a plane or down diving or something 
So you can pick up these things um, and not know consciously why. And then other times they might think, if only I'd noticed, I should have noticed this, I should have noticed that. And they just weren't in that zone when they're in there. So all these things, they're trance states, but they're not obviously hypnotic trance states, but they're helpful for the context that, that you're in. Um, all emotions are obviously trance states. Um, things like being in the zone, I don't know if you'd call that an emotion or not, because it's, it's sort of emotion free normally, it's just there in that moment. Um, all meditation things, practices involve trance states. In fact, trance is so pervasive that there's almost nothing in human culture <laughs> that doesn't have trance as a fundamental part of it. You go to any religion, any spiritual belief, and they have placed trance at the heart of that spiritual belief in some way or another, whether it's, you know, someone had a dream and then created, a, you know, God spoke to them, whatever, and they created something from that. So they were in some kind of altered state in some trance state, and then they created some text or something, um, or they do their healings through a trance state. All these other spiritual traditions, whether they're correct or not, around things like mediums and um, all these other sort of you know psychic things and all these things, again, they always involve trance. So Erickson's view, Erickson talked about a, um, a case of seeing a medium. He went to a medium who was brilliant, so incredible that he thought, I've got to see this woman and you know, if there's someone that can do it, I want to meet them. So he went and met with this woman, she did her thing, and she got it accurate, 100% accurate on everything about Ericsson. Every answer was 100% accurate with no, um, you know, there's no sort of Barnum statements and no statements of, um, you seem like the kind of person that would, and then saying something that actually applies to everyone, but we all think is specific to us. Uh, you know, you seem like someone that can be confident at times, but you really have some anxiety underneath that you just don't share very often. Um, but you like to portray a persona that, and you know, you say these things, and yeah, that's me. Um, but actually it's everyone it's <laughs> or nearly everyone um, and this person didn't do any of that they just said this is a fact this is a fact this is a fact and um, but Ericsson obviously has good observation skills and um, seems to also be very good at reflecting back on what's just been going on and he was aware of exactly what she noticed he was aware that as she was talking about certain things his breathing had changed and that she had picked that up and that by putting herself into this medium trance that she would have thought of it as, she was picking up on all this unconscious behaviour of his and not she believed 100% that the messages that were coming through were obviously from spirits, but he could see that her unconscious was feeding her messages that were genuine 100% based on observations that she was picking up on and not even knowing she was picking up on. So she picked up on changes to his breathing or picked up on slight emphasis on certain words that he used or um, picked up on certain subtle head movements, maybe head nodding or head shaking based on something she just said. Um, and he was aware that she was only picking up on all of this and did a brilliant job of it, but she wasn't psychic but she 100% believed she was because she was so accurate and couldn't explain it. And she, you know, when you have no other explanation and you believe in that, then that's very likely you're going to carry on believing that because no one's told you. Well, what you've just done is you've just read that when you mentioned mothers and fathers, you saw that when you mentioned mothers, I, and when you mentioned fathers, I relaxed. Or, you know, she didn't know she picked up on those things. So being in trance does make you hyper aware, um, which sort of flies in the face of what most people that are about to come in and be hypnotized think. They think that they're going to be knocked out somehow, almost like someone just clouted them around the head and they've got no conscious awareness of anything at all. When the reality is you're normally hyper aware on training courses. If someone walked in that door whilst we were doing this training course and you were all there with your eyes shut, you would feel that someone's in that doorway and you would feel if their eyes looked at you, but you wouldn't necessarily know why because your senses obviously are heightened and so you notice these subtle changes. You notice things like, um, I know that I've experienced it, where you notice someone's body warmth as they've walked past behind you, whereas ordinarily people walk back and forth and you don't pay any attention, you don't notice them at all. But because you're in that heightened state, you actually notice um, Darren Brown's thing on his shows is he says, I'm not hypnotizing you. I'm putting you into a heightened state of awareness. 
so you'll be more aware of things. So what he's doing is saying, I'm hypnotizing you, but I'm going to tell you what hypnosis actually is and tell you I'm just doing that to you. And I'm not going to tell you that I'm hypnotizing you. So trance is really our sort of reality generator. Um, and it's overlaid with our internal and external reality are both here at the same time. And what you'll notice I do, and hopefully what you'll all pick up on and do as well, is that you treat the person in front of you as we are in, I'm in your reality. You will have what's going on around here that I can share as well in this out, out sort of external reality, but you also have your own internal reality overlaying this external reality. So if I asked you about um, you know, what, what colour is your front door at home or something, you'd suddenly notice that in your mind's eye, but it will be in a slightly different place for each of you. So it could be sort of here, or it could be over here somewhere, or it, you know, wherever it happens to be, you'll notice it in your mind's eye, but it'll be out here. So your mind's eye actually is projecting it out into this reality. So when I talk with people, for example, one thing we're gonna cover um, is manipulating internal, sort of the way something's represented in your mind. And a lot of people say things like, um, oh, just, just move that away from you, or just move that closer to you. And they gesture to themselves. But actually, if you are if you just constantly assume you're in someone else's reality, what you would do is say, you know, just move that towards yourself. And you do it to them. So what you do is you push whatever's in their mind towards them, because they they sort of link you into their reality, both internal and external. So when you do that, you genuinely push whatever they were seeing there towards them and they generally experience it as being pushed towards them. Whereas if you just gesture to yourself, that does nothing. All that does is it, it says, I want you to do this, but you're not treating them as I'm in your, I'm in your world. I'm a part of your world. It's a bit like almost taking Ericsson's my voice will go with you thing to the extreme because it's not just my voice will go with you, but I'm actually here with you in your world. So if I, um, talk about getting rid of it like one technique you can do is you have someone imagine something scary on the palm of your hand and you sort of move it around but then you throw it away so you you genuinely think right because I've told you to imagine it here you are seeing it right here this is where I've told you to imagine it so when I do that and scrumple it up like paper you are genuinely going to experience it as being scrumpled up and if I then just throw it away there's no point in throwing it that way because I'm throwing it at you. So you genuinely throw it away in another direction or something. So you do things as if you are in their world. You don't act as if their inner world and their outer world are two separate things and you don't have access to the inner world. You treat it as trance and reality and the whole thing is one big package. It's all holistic. There's not a separation between them. Your inner world overlays your outer world. Um, we all gaze off into space and you see people doing it all the time. So, yeah, so you have to treat it as people are holistic. People are just one whole being. They're not um, separate parts where you've got uh, an inner world, an outer world. So when you work with a client, everything you do. So if you say to somebody, um, again, the fast phobia technique, I'll often do it if someone has a TV screen or something. I'll often do it using their TV. So if someone was sat here, You'd say, uh, or if there's no TV, so there's not a TV over there. So you'd say, um, just see that on the TV over there. And you don't look at them when you say that. You look at the TV over there that you imagine as well. So you hallucinate their reality. So you join that. You say, I'm a part of your reality. You're, we're not separate. We are one. In this context, you know, therapist and client become one. So I don't look at you and say, imagine TV over there. I look over there and say, see that TV over there. And then when I'm talking about the TV, so the, the fast phobia cure has the person, the traditional one is the person sat in a uh, cinema somewhere looking out at a, a cinema screen. They then come out of themselves and up into a projection booth, looking down at themselves, watching the cinema screen. And then on the cinema screen is the bad, whatever it is that's happened, the bad thing that's happened. Um, a variation of that is that you have them stood the problem with it is if they can see if they're in the projection booth they can see the screen they can just look up so you tell them to look at them here but if they look at them here and then they go oh, i wonder what's on the screen over there and then they look up they traumatize themselves again because they see what's scary um so what you can do is have them go next to the screen 
because then they can't see it because they'd have to sort of bend around and look at it. Uh, so it makes it more likely not to have them have a bad reaction because you're they're in a position they genuinely can't see the screen from. Uh, they've got to uh, they'd have to move to see the screen. So what you do when you do it with them is you talk to the person here and say what I'd like you to do is just imagine yourself drifting out of your body and just floating over there. So even though their eyes are shut, perhaps, you, you make sure they're aware, your voice has changed, you make sure they're aware and you point, you do everything that you would do if, because you genuinely say, I am in your, your world here. So you point, say, just go over there next to the screen and you look over to where you want them to go. And then they imagine themselves over there. And then when you go through the technique, you talk, here saying, yeah, you can imagine yourself back here, you can imagine yourself over there, and you move your voice around. And with their eyes shut, they hear your voice moving, they pick up, as I've already mentioned, in trance, the deeper and more pure the trance is, the more focused and aware you are. So um, you're making sure you know, they pick up on these subtle cues. Whereas if you did the whole thing talking here, and as you might see a lot of hypnotists do, a lot of hypnotists might just talk to the client and say, Okay, what I'd like you to do is imagine yourself in a cinema screen. Now imagine yourself over next to the cinema screen. And they might talk just here, but that does nothing for the client's inner experience. You're not matching their experience. You're dictating to them and expecting them to somehow work everything out for themselves on the inside and translate it into their experience. Um, likewise, when I make self-hypnosis MP3s, I will hallucinate the client. So I would see them, if I was making a CD for Chris, I would hallucinate Chris here, and I would hypnotise the hallucinated version of Chris. And I would do everything to this, I'd have um, a microphone here, and I would do everything as if Chris is genuinely sat here. So if I saw this hallucinated version shift in the seat, I would say, that's right, you can shift a little bit. Because I trust that in the real situation, he's going to shift at that point. Um, if I was doing a technique where I wanted him to look over there, the audio recorders here, I would look over there. So my voice on the recording now is in a different location. So that when he listens to it back, it matches the reality I expect him to have because I've hallucinated him. I haven't just written out a script on a bit of paper and sat there. Okay, close your eyes. That's right. And I haven't just read something off a sheet of paper that's very static. I've literally thought, okay, what would he be doing? Let's imagine the client there in front of me. And I do this... Uh, especially when I was uh, training, I would do this with hallucinated clients. So before new clients, uh, when I was getting my first load of clients, I would hallucinate the clients and I'd think, how would they react? What would I do? What would I say? So that I can get used to this idea of, you know, they go through this process, you hallucinate them and you, you almost, well, it's mental rehearsal. You almost, you build it up so that you know they're going to respond like this. I expect them to respond like this. And then when you come to do it and I've done it, as I say, with doing self-hypnosis tracks where people have then opened their eyes halfway through because they freaked out because they've suddenly thought I'm in the room with them because I'm commenting on something that I shouldn't know if I recorded it a month earlier. Um, so they'll suddenly shift in their seat and I'll say, that's right, you can shift a little bit if you want and just get comfortable. And then, how do you know that? <laughs> He's not here. And they suddenly open their eyes and panic thinking I must be in the room with them because it suddenly confuses them. And then they, they realise it's okay, it's safe. And, and sometimes I comment on that as well. Um, <laughs> um, or I'll comment that some I know someone's about to laugh. And so I say, it's okay, you can find that funny if you want. Um, but you know, just relax again. And, and you just comment on all these things. It doesn't matter how ridiculous it sounds when you say it. The chances are, if you're saying it and it comes to your mind, it will happen when the real situation happens because your your brain is very good at being able to know how someone is going to react to something. It's a bit like there was research done for golfing. And uh, they said to people, we want you to pretend to be Tiger Woods and just hit the ball. Pretend to be Tiger Woods, hit the ball. People pretended and did brilliant. They said, now play normally. And miss the ball and they whack it over there and it goes all over the place. So when you were pretending, what was different? Well, when I was pretending to be Tiger Woods, obviously I could play because I was being Tiger Woods. So why couldn't you do it when you're being normal? So, you know, when you imagine something, you're actually better at imagining things than you realise, and it has more of an effect on you as a being than you realise. So uh, 
obviously some hypnotists believe everything's got to be about relaxation and you've got people talking about the relaxation response and all these other techniques associated with relaxation. Um, you have hypnotists that teach that um, you know, when you go into hypnosis, you go into an alpha state and actually that's complete rubbish. When you get relaxed, you go into an alpha state. So if you do hypnosis that involves relaxation, you'll get an alpha state, but it's the relaxation that's the alpha state part not the hypnosis. There's so far never been any state that has been identified as, oh, look, this brain pattern means somebody or this bunch of brain waves or whatever means somebody is in hypnosis. Um, and that's been the ongoing argument among uh, researchers of hypnosis for decades now has been, is it a state or is it not a state? So is it people playing along and something more social and you're just complying with things um, or is it an actual state of mind where there's a brain pattern that you should be able to identify that means that you should be able to put a brain cap on to um, anyone at all and be able to say yes that person was genuinely hypnotized no that person genuinely wasn't so far they've never found anything you get people talking about an alpha state but that's just associated with relaxation you get people talking about different other states um, brainwave states but normally it's associated with different aspects so for example when people dream they go into one bunch of brain waves so if you get someone hallucinating in their mind so going into a trance where they can see a lot inside their head clearly they're in a dream kind of state so they show those brain patterns but it's not the hypnosis as such it's what you've just asked them to do um, if you get someone really relaxed then they'll have lots of alpha waves. But it, again, it's not the hypnosis, it's the relaxation. They um, disproved that because that was a, such a common myth for years and years that they ha hypnotized people on exercise bikes because that way they thought this person is not gonna be relaxed, but we can get them hypnotized, but because they're exercising, they will not be relaxed. And they showed all signs of just being in a normal waking state virtually, except that they were a bit more they're responsive and they're doing what they're asked to do so they can have pain control and stuff yet they were pedaling away on an exercise bike um, and soldiers that march all the time they become technically hypnotized they fall into a rhythm they fall into that march they can get blisters on their feet and they can still carry on for sort of 10 20 30 miles completely oblivious to any pain or anything and they're definitely not relaxed <laughs> um, and yet they're in that state and with trance indicators, it's not that all of them are always there. And again, some of them are associated more or less with different aspects of trance. So someone relaxed clearly is more likely to say, be totally cataleptic and stationary versus someone who's on an exercise bike being hypnotized where they're not going to be totally cataleptic. They might be, uh, they might show the economy of movement, which I don't know if I've mentioned that. Um, they might show economy of movement where they only make the minimal movements needed for that given uh, state. So they might only move their legs and not sort of move the whole body while they're cycling because they only need to move their legs. Mm -hmm. So they'll only do the absolute minimum necessary in the same way that someone that's hypnotized reaches for a glass, perhaps just with their arm, if that's all that's needed. So if it's in reach of an arm, they'll only move their arm, pick the glass up and only move their arm back. Whereas ordinarily people shift in their seat and they get their body weight in a certain position and then they move their arm, but they move their entire body first and then they reach for the glass and they, and they do a whole load of extra movements they don't need to actually do just because that's what we normally do. We make lots of extra movements that are unnecessary, that are a waste of time, but actually we just, they're a habit and you know, we're quite sloppy as creatures generally. We... Um, we don't mind making lots of extra movements. We don't need to conserve energy in the same way that we perhaps used to need to, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. So now we don't. We do all sorts of things that waste energy because we've got plenty of it. Um, but someone hypnotized has the same world. They still don't need to save energy, but they just do. You know, you say, pick that glass up, their arm moves over, picks it up and moves back again. Um, you say to someone conscious, pick that glass up, and they lean over and pick the glass up and move back again. Um, so there's lots of things that, like, actually hypnosis isn't directly associated with increased suggestibility. Normally, um, status leads to increased suggestibility. So a hypnotist with status gets better suggestibility than whether the person's hypnotized or not. 
just because they've got that status, like the Stanley Milgram tests. It's compliance generally comes from the position you hold or the position they perceive you to hold as opposed to something called hypnosis. Responsiveness to what you say is increased. So if you say to somebody consciously, you know, blush on half your face, they probably won't be able to do it. You say to somebody who is hypnotized, blush on half your face, and it doesn't mean they've increased suggestibility, but they can do it because they've increased responsivity to the ideas that you're conveying rather than necessarily just responding to, oh, I'm more suggestible now because I've been hypnotized. So it's, um, it seems to be quite a common thing that people say, you know, you're more suggestible when you're hypnotized. And there probably is a very small increase in suggestibility, but the research done when comparing it to the same situation without the hypnosis is that people are just as suggestible when you sit them in a chair and say, I'm a doctor and I'm going to tell you what to do now. And they still do the same. They still comply. They still follow along. Um, they, they still respond relatively well to things, even things that you wouldn't normally expect them to respond to because the situation is, you know, I'm about to give you an electric shock. It's going to really hurt. And I want you to make that hand numb. And the motivation for that hand to be numb because you know it's going to hurt in, included with the fact the guy's sat there with a white lab coat on or something and a stethoscope round his neck and doctor before his name and you know all of that makes it like this has just got to work and so you become depending how broad you define the term hypnosis you could say that's hypnosis that that's uh, altogether is hypnosis in itself um, it definitely induces a trance or a specific way of being um, but actual suggestion isn't just a hypnotic thing um, but responding better to ideas is so you do respond better to ideas and concepts so normally you can't control increasing white blood cells and things but under hypnosis you can normally you can't blush on half your face technically someone creative probably could they could imagine like a hot frying pan touching a face or something and then that part if they're really imaginative that thought would be enough to make them be able to make that half their face redder. Um, likewise, you could imagine yourself looking into a bright light. Some people are normally you can't control easily how you um, dilate or uh, decrease your eyes, um, but some people can, and they can do things like uh, I think Erickson talked about his daughter being able to imagine a bright light shining in her eyes. So that she could imagine it shining in one eye, and as long as she imagined that bright light shining in one eye, her eye would suddenly constrict because it would be assuming there's a bright light. But the other eye would stay normal, and that would freak doctors out because <laughs> it would look like she's obviously got some kind of illness or something because her eyes are different to each other. Um, and so she would do it for fun. But he said that it's things like that that led him to believe that you needed to look deeper than just can this person do this? Because some people can do it even when it's out of hypnosis. So there's that argument of, did the hypnosis make that happen? Or is it something they could have done even if you didn't hypnotize them? I would say if they, if they didn't realize you were doing it to them, they could blush and not even realize it's happened. Um, so you could do it one way is you could just do it by changing your voice. So you could talk either looking in one eye and then the other or moving your head slightly so that you talk aiming ideas at that part of the face and that part of the face and the person doesn't even realize you're doing it and you just sort of talk about warmth and coolness and to the point where the warmth ends up making one side go redder than the other side um, and whether they believe that that was going to happen or it's possible wouldn't matter too much um, it's a bit like with placebo the latest placebo research is that it's not actually about conscious belief a large part of it because they've done placebo in rats they've been able to get rats to follow placebo and obviously rats shouldn't be thinking i don't believe in it so it's not going to work with me <laughs> so um so if you can do a placebo in a rat then clearly it's not the belief part and what it seems to be is that it's more about what's the pattern of expectation so if a rat is given a medication 10 times in a row and it has a specific effect when you give it a fake medication the 11th and 12th and 13th time it expects that because you're you're consistently following the same pattern that it's going to have the same outcome even though it's not 
the body responds assuming you've just given it exactly the same thing again. Um, so they're now looking deeper at placebo and at whether belief obviously plays a part in initially getting it going. It's much easier when someone believes something's going to work. But there's so much that goes on outside of the, that level of belief that people just fall into patterns of um, you know when someone wears a white lab coat and they're a doctor and they tell you something, normally what they've just told you is true. And if that's your belief and that's your expectation, not necessarily your conscious belief, consciously you might be thinking, oh, doctors are rubbish, they never say anything of any sense. But if every time you've been to see them, your experience has actually been, well, when I've seen them, it's actually been okay. But my belief is that with everyone else, it's rubbish because because that's often what it is, that you, know, you go to a doctor for flu or something and they give you what you need and you take it and you get better. You know, but then you hear all these stories of other people being given the wrong things or being prescribed antidepressants where it would have been better to give them some form of therapy. And, um, so your belief as a profession thing is, as a profession, they mess up a lot of times. But your, belief, your own experience is, well, it seems to work for me though. So you end up going along with, the pattern is, what's my experience? not what's my belief. So your experience is it works. Uh, likewise with painkillers, you, know, you take uh, red pills and they work far more effective than if you take white pills. So uh, even if, um, so I know that's just a placebo. So if I want to buy painkillers and take painkillers, I always buy red because I know it's going to work better even though I know that's only the placebo effect. It's not any different to the white version. Uh, likewise, if you buy more expensive painkillers, they work better than cheap ones, even though, again, they're no different. What's in them is no different. So if you buy ones that are on a saver option, like buy one, get one free or something, actually, when you buy it, the fact you bought it cheap means it won't be as effective, even though it's no different to when it was full price. So, um, does that yeah. mean expensive hypnotherapy? Works, works better, it does. <laughs> Which is why people doing quit smoking hypnotherapy sessions and charging hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds and more effective than people that just say, look, I just charge my normal standard hourly rate. So you're far more effective just because the perception is, well, it's expensive, so it's obviously good. Um, I taught a course where someone in the audience said, um, yeah, no disrespect, but um, why should I listen to you? And I thought, you chose to come here. It was free. Um, I said, why should I listen to you? You're not famous. So that means you're rubbish. And I said, how did you work that out? And I said, well, Paul McKenna's famous. That means he's brilliant. And um, so I said, well, how do you do that? So well, when someone's famous, it, they're famous because it means they're brilliant. It means everyone thinks they're brilliant, so they obviously must be. And that, that was this person's logic. So clearly, he probably has a lot of success, Paul McKenna does, because of the fact that he's famous, regardless. And Erickson used to say that about himself. He used to say a lot of his success is because he is Milton Erickson. It's not because he's a, an amazing therapist. Is because someone sits down opposite him, he looks at them, and they go, oh my God, I'm going to go now. That's it. My mind's just, it's going to, um, the world's about to just disappear. <laughs> you know, my reality's about to change. And it, they were thinking that. at the point. So obviously there is a level of belief. You go in there and expectation, and if people think you're the most incredible person, suddenly they react to that, and, and it's far more effective. So, you know, charging a lot, you get better results. Um, just because you charged a lot um, and there's they have more of a vested interest in it working as well you know, if you chart if you pay a lot of money for something you don't want to waste your money you want to know that what you've just spent was good whereas if you think oh well the session's free so if it works it works if it doesn't it doesn't it's fine you don't have much motivation to put anything in beyond the therapy um, so things like following tasks you don't follow tasks if it's free unless you're very motivated, you just think, oh, wow, obviously it wasn't for me. And you just move on with your life and carry on as if you didn't have the therapy. Whereas if you've just paid a fortune for it and they set you a task, you do the task because you want to know that therapy is going to work. But yeah, we will stop for a brief break. And then it's on to pattern matching.